Okay, starting with uh, the Odyssey by Homer. Hopefully you read the introduction by Bernard Knox. Uh, very lengthy, very informative introduction. So I don't want to uh, spend much time. I don't really want to spend any time talking about it, but I'm going to um, say just a couple of things. One regarding the um, date of composition of the poem in terms of whether it is orally composed or um, written, Knox makes the claim, makes the statement um, that probably the best date in terms of what we have before us is uh, the latter half of the 8th century BC. Um, latter half, of course, means closer in time towards us, right? So that's roughly 700 to 750 um, BC. And he, he talks quite a bit, he writes quite a bit about um, two different theories in, in terms of its composition. Take them out, not different theories, two theories. One, the oral formulaic uh, theory that it was composed entirely orally in the uh, original poet, call him Homer's mind, and was delivered orally probably uh, over a period of two or three days, okay? Um, and the other one really that it, it's a combination of that and um, a literate comp composition, that is a written composition, okay? It used to be thought up until oh, 40, 50 years ago that it was probably entirely oral in original composition. Um, that it was composed in the mind, orally delivered, writing had nothing, excuse me, to do with it. Now it's more thought that it, it's probably a combination that it began orally and very quickly began to have some written components work in, et cetera. I don't want to talk about it much more other than that. One of the reasons that we see the, the oral component is you see what are called formulas all throughout the poem. You know, um, gray-eyed Athena, uh, you know, you'll hear Circe and Calypso referred to as, you know, the nymphs with the long twisted braids or things like that, the wine dark sea, and that's the Aegean sea that you see behind me. Um, things like that. Those are used to help fill out the metrical line, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, a couple of things <clears throat> about epics, and I'm going to share the screen for a moment uh, to just put up a document that um, has, I think, six characteristics of an epic. <clears throat> and so uh, these are not necessarily in order okay, of, of importance or anything. You have the epic catalog, usually or often a listing of heroes, armor, ships, plants, animals, battles, you know, things like that. Um, in some works, they can be very long. Uh, just about all of book two in the Iliad is an epic catalog and it's a listing of the ranks of armies, essentially, right? The epic subject, um, sorry, that should read, has to be a great, hold on just a second. I think it's gonna let me uh, do it. Has to be a great <coughs> lofty subject, such as founding of a nation or people, as in Virgil's the Aeneid, a uh, nationalistic battle, as in the Iliad, you know, which is the Achaeans or Greeks versus the Trojans, a nationalistic hero, like the Odyssey, um, major historical or mythical event. Some major epics are Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid. Many people consider Dante's Divine Comedy an epic. Uh, Milton's Paradise Lost is often considered to be the greatest epic. Some would say Beowulf, the Song of Roland, which is about the life of Charlemagne. <laughs> Okay, third item, invocation of the news. They all begin with that. That is the epic actually begins with the invocation of the muse. And the reason for that is you invoke the muse, one of the daughters of Zeus. Um, you 
invoke the muse to inspire you, to enable you to do what you are attempting to do, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, the Aeneid begins with, I sing of arms on the man, and then talks about Aeneid and invokes the muse to help Virgil properly, you know, say what it is he wants to say. We're gonna see the same thing <coughs> beginning of the odyssey sing to me of the man muse the man of twists and turns driven etc etc we'll talk about it in a few more minutes okay um what else epic epithets or tags and you've got some examples there you know the phrase of the white arms or swift feet uh of the cunning mind or crafty minded odysseus for example wine dark sea okay often these are solely used to help fill out the line these are examples also formulas. That is, the poet is singing and, you know, he's, while he's verbally singing, the mind is looking ahead to what is coming or it might possibly be even creating what's coming and realizes, you know, he's got a line coming that only has, say, for example, um, 10 syllables and he needs 12 syllables. Well, he can throw in, you know, something, or he might need, you know, four syllables, so the wine dark sea gets thrown in or something like that, okay? Epic simile, it's exactly what a simile is, but it's an epic one. That is, it, it involves the epic subject and is a comparison with the animal or natural world or other phenomena, you, often beginning with like or as, as similes do, and it will, you know, as, talking about, you know, maybe the ranks of the Achaean soldiers in the Iliad, and then just as, and then we'll get a description of how, you know, I don't know, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, you know, do their bit in stalking their prey, and then you'll get the phrase, so, and the poet will take us back, bring us back to the world of the poem, and back to the story. So, just as you know, the sky or the clouds go scudding across the sky at night, just so, and then we get the example. An epic simile, however, is often very long. It's often several lines, more than just a phrase, like the, you know, just as the cloud goes scudding across the sky, that, like I just used. It, it's usually multiple lines long, okay? Um, and then the last big thing, is every epic begins in medius race. And medius race is a Greek, uh, take that back, Latin term, and it just means in the middle of things. So you get plopped into the middle of the story. Notice when, when we open with the Odyssey, we open with Telemachus and Penelope back at the palace in Ithaca. But the poem's really about Odysseus. So we open in the middle, we find out what's going on with Telemachus and such. We get four books about Telemachus. Then we go back to, Ed, um, not Oedipus, uh, Odysseus, and we find out what happened to him since the Trojan War. And then we pick up, you know, in real time, so to speak, in book 12, when he leaves the land of the Phaeacians, the uh, Phaeacians, and goes back to Ithaca, and then we see, you know, the whole resolution of um, the poem and such, okay? So, let me stop sharing. <clears throat> Couple of other um, things before we jump in. The first four books, if, if you read the, the introduction, the first four books are sometimes, almost always, called the Telemachy, T-E-L-E-M-A-C-H-Y, or the Telemachia, or Telemachia, T-E-L-E-M-A-C-H-E-I-A, -E or T-E-L-E-M-A-C-H-I-A, -E -E one of those two. All that means is that they're about Telemachus. Right? Oedipus' son. Sorry, not Oedipus, Odysseus's son. I'll warn you right now, if you hear me say Oedipus, think Odysseus. I'm 
going to make that uh, mistake quite often, it appears. <clears throat> okay, so they're about Odysseus's son. Why? Um, well, how old was Telemachus when Odysseus went off to battle, when Odysseus left for the Trojan War? We're not told specifically, though we are told he was a baby, okay? He did not know his father, so to speak. He was probably only a few months. So at this point in, in the poem, he's probably about 19. How do we know? The Trojan War took 10 years, okay? They were essentially stymied. That is, the um, odds were even on both sides for nine years because Zeus kept kind of intervening to stop the Greeks from winning and such. Tenth year, the, the Greeks won. And then many of them got back relatively quickly. Okay? But Odysseus, because he, you know, um, What's the word I want? Um, affronted, um, can't think of the word. Angered, Poseidon. Odysseus, when we meet up with him, is in his ninth year trying to get back. So he's been gone 19 years, okay? Agamemnon, when he returned, Agamemnon had been gone 10 years, right? Uh, Menelaus, when he returned, he'd been gone 10 years, maybe a little bit more because of the additional journeys he had to go into. Nestor, 10 years, etc. okay? So the first four books are about Telemachus and they're about Telemachus, essentially, he's 19 now, learning how to be a man. Now, what does that mean? Learning how to be a prince, son of a king, learning how to be a ruler, learning how to run the home, run the house, even though his mother's there, his nurse is there, he's got advisors, etc. Uh, but he's beaten, being eaten out of hand at home um, by the suitors and such. <coughs> so one of the reasons we're going to see, Athena sends him off to Nestor, and then he goes off to Menelaus, is to, one, learn about what's happened to his father, but two, also learn how to be a good prince. And he learns that partially by being around princes of other kings, Nestor and Menelaus. Okay? <clears throat> so the, the first four books, the Telemachia, the Telemachia, however you want to pronounce it, um, they're also a Bildungsroman, <clears throat> 19th century Germanic term, German term that means a development of character. There, we, we see a boy grow up. That's what Harry, the Harry Potter novels are essentially a Bildungsroman of Harry Potter, okay? A little bit different here. So, having said that, I'm just looking at some old notes I have. Um, let's pick up <coughs> with the beginning. I don't know if this lecture will take three hours. I'm hoping it won't. Uh, we're only going to, not only, we're going to cover books one through 12. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but I've got a bunch of sticky notes and a bunch of folded back pages. That's, you know, all pages that I might want to talk about, but I don't know that I will. Okay, so book one. Here's the invocation. <coughs> Sing to me of the man Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course. Once he had plundered the hollowed, hallowed heights of Troy. <clears throat> Hold on, I want to start a clock. <clears throat> uh, the hallowed heights of Troy, many cities of men he saw and learned their minds, many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. Let me pause there for a minute. Did he see many cities of men? 
I mean, if you talk about at least through books one through 12, because it's in book 13, it gets back home to Ithaca. So pretty much that focuses on Ithaca and the environs around Ithaca. <clears throat> no, but if you think of books one through 12, what cities of men did Odysseus see? And just off the top of my head, I can only think of one that is in terms of a real city, and that's the city of the Phaeacians, right? Where Alcinous is king and Nausicaa is, you know, the king's daughter and such. Everywhere else, he's either with Circe, he's either with Calypso, he, you know, the Lastragonians, Hades, um, the island of the sun god of Helios. Um, and that's about it. I mean, because he spends several years, eight or nine, just with Calypso. So many cities and many saw, learn the mind, etc. But he could not save them. Line seven he could not save them from disaster hard as he strove the recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all and we'll we'll see whether or not that's true okay the blind fools they devoured the cattle of the sun and the sun god wiped from the sight wiped from sight the day of their return well a lot of his men have been lost before that point we'll we'll get to that in book 12 okay launch out on his story muse daughter of zeus Start from where he will, sing for our time too, okay? So that's, that's the opening 12 lines. And what's the first thing really we hear about? He's being held by Calypso, okay? Top of, page is right back. Top of page 78 in the Fagel's edition. Um, lines... 16 and following, it looks like. Okay. That he's with Calypso, et cetera, et cetera. He wants to get home. Poseidon won't let him. And we jump down to the middle of that page, and the poet speaks about Agamemnon. Line 34. The father of men and gods was first to speak. Sorely troubled, remembering handsome Aegisthus, the man Agamemnon's son, renowned Orestes killed. You know, who is speaking? So Poseidon has left. This is the Olympic Council. This is the Council of the Gods, C O U N C I L, not C O U N S E L. This is a meeting, an assembly of the gods. And Zeus speaks. And notice the first, you know, the the first one he talks about is, is not Odysseus, it's Agamemnon. Recalling Aegisthus, or Aegisthus, um, Zeus harangued the immortal powers, that is, the other gods. Ah, how shameless the way these mortals blame the gods. And that's Zeus saying, look, these humans down here, they're blaming us for everything. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries, Yes, but they themselves, with their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. Now, Zeus is implying there that because we live, we're going to suffer. We're going to have our own proper share of suffering. Okay? And he says, what happens, though, is... Because humans, because mortals are reckless. What does reckless mean? It means lack of thought. Wreck is like the, the part of the word reckon. Like to reckon something means to think about, to consider. So reckless is without consideration, without thought, with their own reckless ways. And we could jump forward here to, you know, all the way to book 12, to the passage of 
you know, Odysseus and his men on the island of Helios, the sun god. And Odysseus warns them, whatever you do, don't touch his sheep, don't touch his cattle, don't touch his rams. And they get hungry, they run out of the food that, you know, Xerxes provided them with. Odysseus is lulled into sleep by the gods and his men slaughter the cattle and sheep and such. They say we're going to offer Helos this great sacrifice later as long as we live and it doesn't do any good obviously. So that's being reckless. But they themselves with their own reckless ways compound their pains. That is they, we, bring pain onto the pains that we're bound to get naturally just from living. Look at Aegisthus now. Above and beyond his share, that is, his share of pain, he stole the three days Agamemnon's wife. By stealing Clytemnestra, he compounded, he added to his pain. Though he knew it meant his total, he murdered the warlord coming home from Troy, though he knew it meant his total ruin, okay? Do we know that from the play Agamemnon? No, we don't. So we're told by Zeus, line 45 or so, far in advance, we told him so ourselves, dispatching the giant, uh, dispatching the guy, the giant killer Hermes. Giant killer there is one of those um, epic, epithets or tags that I mentioned. It's one of those formulas. Almost every time, in fact, it might be every time, Hermes is mentioned, he's called the giant killer, okay? And so we're told that Hermes was sent, because Hermes is the messenger of the gods, Hermes was sent to Aegisthus with this warning. Don't murder the man, don't court his wife. Beware, revenge will come from Orestes, Agamemnon's son. That day he comes of age and longs for his native land. Any indication of that in the play, Agamemnon by Aeschylus? No, not at all. Okay? Remember, this is written. It's, it's written down at least two centuries prior to Aeschylus writing. Aeschylus is writing in the very early 6th century, 500 or so. Um, hold on, let me check his dates very quickly. To um, the late 4th century. Yeah, okay, so Aeschylus's dates are approximately 525, 524 BC to 456, 455, somewhere in there. The, the Odyssey is written down sometime probably in the, the very late 8th century, 700 to 750 maybe. So that's 200 years prior, okay? What, so, so what does this show both poets are doing? They're both working from essentially the same material, right? The, the material that the poet, if the poet Homer actually wrote, that the poet Homer gives us probably, okay? Big, huge probably, probably far predated him. That is, there were probably stories of some of these events that get passed down. So the story of, well, first of all, the Trojan War, we, we think the story itself probably goes back to at least 12 or 1300 BC, right? And then the elements of that, Agamemnon, Odysseus, Achilles, and, and the various stories about them, they're each passed down from generation to generation, you know, kind of like campfire stories, right? So we get here one version of that story. Just like today, we've got multiple versions of the Arthurian myth. Big difference is the Arthurian myth is entirely literate. It was written down from the beginning, okay? So, Aegisthus was warned, 
and he went ahead, even though he was warned, he went ahead and did what he did, right? So that's how he compounds pain on pain. So Athena then speaks, okay? And we're told in sparkling eyed Athena, this is line, I don't know, 53 or so, drove the matter home, father, son of Cronus, Athena, remember, sprung from the mind of Zeus, she has no mother, our high and mighty king, surely he goes down to a death he earned in full. That is, he gets Zeus, got what he had coming to him. He deserved that. Let them all die so, all who do such things, that is, all who behave like Egistus did. Now, who do such things, I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. I don't think she's necessarily saying, you know, all men who steal other men's wives. I could be wrong. I think what she means is all men who go against the express word of the gods. Because when Hermes goes to him and says, if you do this thing, here's what's going to happen, and he goes ahead and does it. I think that's what she means. Let all men who do that kind of thing, let them suffer the consequences. But my heart breaks for Odysseus, that seasoned veteran, cursed by fate so long. And then she goes on and talks about, you know, what's happening with Odysseus. And then she says, line 71, Olympian Zeus, have you no care for him in your lofty heart? Did he never win your favor with sacrifices, burn beside the ships? Why Zeus, why so dead said? So she's asking her father, she's pleading to him, are you ever going to let Odysseus go home? And he says, how on earth could I forget Odysseus? Great Odysseus who excels all men in wisdom, excels in offerings too. In other words, yes, I have taken note of all the nice offerings he's given to me. He gives the immortal gods who rule the vaulting skies. No, Zeus says, it's not me. It's the earth shaker, Poseidon unappeased, forever fuming against him for the Cyclops whose giant eye he blinded. Now, so we get told, less than 100 lines into the poem, that Odysseus has blinded Poseidon's son, Cyclops, Polyphemus, okay? We will be told the story in full by Odysseus himself later on. So he says, I'm not the one who's stopping Odysseus, it's Poseidon. So Zeus says, but you know, since Poseidon's not here right now, line 91, come, all of us here put together, put heads together now, work out his journey home so Odysseus can return. So we're not talking that it's fate that is keeping Odysseus from returning. It's Poseidon. So now Zeus is saying, let's all of us, the other Olympian gods, let's figure out a plan so that we can get around Poseidon. Lord Poseidon, I trust, will let his anger go. How can he stand his ground? Notice, against the will of all the gods at once, one God alone. How, how can Poseidon thwart all of us together, right? It says, and then, you know, Athena replies and says, okay, if we're going to do that, send Hermes down to the island of Gigia. Gigia or Gigia. Hold on a second. Look at the pronunciation guide in the back. Ojija, okay, so that he can tell Calypso, release Odysseus. And she says, and while he's doing that, I will go to Ithaca to line 105, 104, allow myself to go down to Ithaca, rouse his son to a braver pitch inspire his heart with courage to summon the flowing heritage Achaeans to full assembly, um, speak his mind to all those suitors, slaughtering on and on his droves of sheep and shambling long cattle. I will send him up to Sparta and Sagi Pylos there to learn of his dear father's journey home. 
Perhaps he will hear some news and make his name throughout the modern world. Okay, so I'm going to go down to Ithaca to do what for Telemachus? She's not going to she's not going to turn him into a man. She's not going to you know say some words and he will suddenly become a mighty hero. She's going to rouse him. She's going to the word we use today is encourage. What does encourage mean? She's going to put heart into him. The in part means inside. Kur is heart. She's, and we're going to see the phrase later on, the word enhearten. She's going to enhearten him. Another word we use to kind of describe what God slash the gods can do to people is inspire, breathe into, okay? And so she vows, and what does she do? She takes on the form of mentees. Page 81, line 123, who we're told is Lord of the Tapians. Well, what is mentees? And there's another form of the same name, mentor. What does that mean? What does a mentor do? Okay. A mentor encourages. A mentor builds up. A mentor strengthens the mind and soul and heart and courage. All right? So she's going to go down and, and build up Telemachus. Okay? So she goes down and we're told first one to see her was Telemachus. He's sitting among the suitors. And the suitors, by the way, are Telemachus's age, slightly older. Okay, he's 19, possibly 20. They're probably no more than 24 or 25, right? Because we're going to be told, many of them don't know their fathers because their fathers have been gone. Um, some of them do. Many of, you know, that, that because they didn't know their fathers, that they don't know how to properly behave, right? So he sees her, she comes in um, as Mentis, and we're told, uh, Telemachus, line 140, straight to the porch he went, mortified that a guest might still be standing at the doors. Because she appears and she's only, you know, she's not been welcomed in. Remember that principle of Xenia, hospitality. It runs all throughout the poem. It is almost as if, I'm not saying it is the thing. It might be close. It's almost as if the entire poem is written to exemplify that notion of Xenia, of hospitality, of you provide welcome to strangers and wanderers. We're gonna hear several times that Zeus is the God of wayfarers and wanderers and strangers, okay? So he goes to her, he clasps her right hand, he relieves her once with a long bronze spear, and he says, greetings, stranger, here in our house you find a royal welcome, have some for supper first, etc." So he seats her at the place of honor, we will skip a bit. Um, and they talk, Telemachus draws her attention. Notice he doesn't know it's Athena. Draws her attention to the suitors and talks about how he's beaten out of, eaten out of house and home. And around line 193, he says, but now no use, he's died a wretched death, no comfort left for us, not even if someone somewhere says he's coming home, the day of his return will never dawn. Right? His father's dead, he thinks. He's not left any comfort. In other words, Telemachus is essentially saying, and, and dead didn't leave any, any way to prepare me, and dead didn't, didn't leave any protection for me or for, you know, Penelope, his mother. 
So he says, enough, tell me about yourself, clearly, point by point. Who are you? Where are you from? Your city, your parents, blah, blah, blah. Right? Or are you a friend of father's, a guest from the old days? And Athena replies. She tells him her name, Mentis, right? And she says, you know, your father and I, two, 18 or so, we've been friends forever. And at the bottom of that page, 220, I don't know, five or six, she says, and now I've come. And why? That is, why am I here? I heard he was back. Okay. Telemachus hasn't heard any word about his father for as long as he can remember. I mean, other than like stories about him. He hasn't heard any, any word about is his father even still alive after the Trojan War? Okay. She says, I heard that he was back, your father. But no, the gods thwart his passage. It's the gods that are stopping him. But she says, great Odysseus is not dead, he's still alive. Somewhere in this world he's being held captive. And so she says, I'll make you a prophecy. When the immortal gods are planted in my mind, this is 233 or so, it will come true, I think, though I'm hardly a, hardly see or know the flights of birds. He won't be gone long from the native land he loves, not even fire and shackles bind you father down. He's plodding away to journey home at last. He's never at a loss. So she says, you're truly Odysseus' son. You've sprung up. So in other words, I remember seeing you as a baby. That's what that implies. You've sprung up so. Uncanny resemblance, head, fine eyes. I see him now. That is, I look at you, and I see your father. So, the, you know, Telemachus, yeah, mother always said I was Odysseus' son, etc., etc. You know, but I'm not so certain. I mean, would to God I'd been the son of a happy man whom old age overtook in the midst of his possessions. Notice, kind of each time Telemachus opens his mouth, what comes out? He's kind of whining. He's kind of like, yeah, if only my daddy were here, man. right? Which is why Athena replies, trust me, the gods have not marked out your house for such an unsung future. 240, 260, sorry. What, what's going on here? What's all the banqueting? banqueting? What's the, the carousing? And so Telemachus tells her about the suitors and it says, blaming the gods, notice, 272. Now the gods have reversed our fortunes with a vengeance, wiped that man from the earth like no one else before. Now, she just told him, he's on his way home. This is a prophecy from the gods. He obviously doesn't believe it. I would never have grieved so much about his death. Excuse me. If he'd gone down with the comrades off in Troy or died of the arms of loved ones, etc. Okay. And he finish, finishes little, his little speech, line 281. He's lost and gone now out of sight, out of mind. And I, dot, 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 nice good pause. He's left me tears and grief, nor do I rack my heart and grieve for him alone. No longer now the gods have invented other miseries to plague me. What are the other miseries? The suitors, eating him out of house and home. Okay. So Athena says, oh, how much you need Odysseus. Well, he needs Odysseus for a couple of reasons. One, to protect his kingdom. Two, to learn how to be like Odysseus. To learn how a prince should behave because he's not behaving that way, right? So, 311 or so, Athena counsels him, you know, you need to drive these suitors from your halls. You need to get these men out of here. How long have they been coming? Years. So she says, listen to me. I've got some good advice, 320 and following. Here's what you should do. Get a ship, fill it up with 20 oars, best in sight, Get a crew, go to Pylos, 
find old King Nestor, talk to him, then go over to Sparta, talk to Menelaus, okay? If you hear, line 330, if you hear your father's alive and heading home, hard pressed as you are, brave out, that is, endure one more year. If you hear from either of them that your father is still alive and heading home, come back and survive one more year. But if you hear he's dead, no longer among the living, then come back, raise a burial mound, even though you won't have a body, a memorial mound, okay? Then give your mother to another husband. It. You find out he's alive, come back, suffer it out for another year. If you find out he's dead, come back, raise a memorial mound, do the rites that are proper, and give your mother in marriage to one of the suitors. And what that implies is you plead the kingship for yourself. You're the king if he's dead. Okay? Then she tells him, 336 or so. Then once you've sealed those matters, seen them through, think hard, reach deep down in your heart and soul for a way to kill these suitors in your house by stealth or in open combat. The reach, reach down deep, that's like when a coach tells a team that is losing at halftime, you know, all right, boys, we've got to dig down that is you've got to summon up all the remaining strength courage etc that you have for the final push and notice what she says you got to come up with a way to kill these guys how by stealth or an open combat knife them in the back <laughs> or face on you must not cling to your boyhood any longer it's time you were a man in other words Suck it up, Telemachus. Quit your whining. Quit hanging around your mother's skirts. Suit up. Put on your armor. Haven't you heard what glory? And then we get our second reference to the Agamemnon story. What glory Prince Orestes won throughout the world when he killed that cunning murderous Aegisthus who killed his famous father? See, and Orestes is only about 10 years older than Telemachus. When Agamemnon went away, he was gone for 10 years and came back. Okay? Well, let me rephrase that. In some versions, he was probably about 10 years old or so when Agamemnon went back, like in the play version that we, that we read. Um, here, it's going to be implied in one of the later books um, that when Agamemnon comes back, he's back for a while before, okay? And then Aegisthus kills Agamemnon, and he has the throne for a while. And then Orestes comes in, all right? So, how Orestes, you know, killed Aegisthus. And you, my friend, be brave you too. Line 350. It all rests with you. The it all? What, what's the it? His life? His happiness? His future kingdom, if he's going to become the king? She says, time to act. Right? And, and Telemachus says, I will you counsel me with so much kindness now, line 355, I think it's 55, like a father to a son. See, he kind of insinuates there, this is why I need my father back. I don't know how to act. It's almost like he's suggesting he has no strong male role models in his life at all. His grandfather's still alive. 
but he won't come into the citadel where if where the palace is. He's staying out in the fields. Okay. Um, so he offers her a gift. Why? Because that's what you do to strangers. Notice, even though his, his father hasn't been there to teach him, he understands this. The stranger comes, you give that stranger gifts. Okay. And Athena says, don't give it to me now. Just wait till I return, etc. Okay. She takes off. And we're told line 370, 371. He felt his senses quickened, overwhelmed with wonder. This was a god. And now he realized Mentes wasn't who he said he was. This was a god in human form. So um, let's see here. Bottom of that page, beginning line 400 and such or top of the next page, line 401, he goes on and he starts blaming Zeus. It's because of Zeus that all these problems exist. Zeus is to blame. He deals to each and every labor on this earth, whatever do me pleases. Why fault the bard? Because the bard was singing about, you know, the Trojan War and Penelope told him to stop. Courage, mother, 405 or so. Harden your heart and listen. Well, he just a few minutes earlier had to have someone tell him, buck up, okay? Harden your heart and listen. Odysseus was scarcely the only one you know whose journey home was blotted out at Troy. And he goes on and says, so many others died also. Notice he doesn't tell her, I've received a prophecy that dad is still alive, okay? So he goes on, tells her 10 year tasks. What are her tasks? weaving, the distaff in the loom and such. As for giving orders, men will see to that, but I most of all, I hold the reins of power in this house. Okay, what's going on? He's asserting himself. He's, he's showing his princely character. He's saying, father is gone. I think he's dead. I'm in charge. And we're told, astonished, she withdrew. Why astonished? He's never acted like this before. He's never stood up for himself. Now, admittedly, he's only standing up to his mother. He's not standing up to the suitor yet, right? And we hear, you know, the suitor's party and such. And we get several speeches back and forth. Um, Antinous, one of the suitors. Eurymachus, another suitor, okay? Um, which um, I was going to say, but I'm going to skip the speeches. Book two, Telemachus sets sail, okay? Um, Telemachus, let's see here, beginning with the brown lines, 80, it's not 82, um, 88 or so. No, I'll take that back. Telemachus beginning around 41, you know, kind of castigates the suitors. He, he just, you know, starts leveling charges at them. Oh, they should be ashamed of themselves, you know. They've got, they've got plenty to eat, to eat at their own houses, yet they're eating him out of house and home. He says, you know, line 71, they should fear the God's wrath, you know. And he kind of appeals to Zeus and stuff. And then Antinous, line 90, line 90 and following, you know, says, come off it, Telemachus, such unbridled anger. You know, why are you accusing us? You're not angry really at us. The problem is your mother. Your mother, you know, for three years we've been here, you know, courting her, so to speak. What does she keep doing? She says, you know, when I finish this weaving, then I'll marry him, marry you, and, you know, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, he says we believed her until we found out. Every night she goes goes back up to her room, and what does she do? She undoes the weaving. He says, "Well, time's up." Line one thirty six. It looks like 
So we will devour your worldly goods and wealth as long as she holds out. As long as she decides not to marry someone, he says, we're going to keep eating all your goods. Holds to that course the gods have charted deep inside her heart. In other words, if she keeps doing what the gods have suggested that she do, if she follows the gods rather than us, well, then we're going to, right? So Telemachus says, how can I drive her away against her will? Line 149. What would I suffer from her father and some dark god? Would hurt me even more when mother, leaving her own house behind, falls down her withering furies on my head. We've already heard the story of Agamemnon, Aegisthus, Orestes alluded to. I think it's fair to say he's probably familiar with the rest of the story about the furies and such. Okay? So he says, no, I'm not going to essentially forced my mother to call the Furies on me. So he begs him to leave. And then he prays to Zeus and such, okay? And Zeus answers the prayer by sending a sign, 168 and following, okay? Um, let's see here. Polytherse speaks and tells them line 190, I myself am no stranger to prophecy, I can see it now. Odysseus, all is working out for him, I say, just as I said it would that day the Argive sailed. After many blows, all the shipmates lost. After 20 years, he'll come home. Unrecognized by all. And now look, it all comes to pass. So Halitherses tells him, I prophesied before he even left, he would come back after 20 years, and that when he came back, he wouldn't look like what we're used to him looking like. And Eurymachus tells him to shut up, you, you know, quit your babbling, your omens and such. Science sounds kind of like both Oedipus, about the prophecies of Tiresias and Oedipus the king, and Crayon about the prophecies of Tiresias in Antigone. Notice Eurymachus there, lines 200 and following. What's he implying about prophecy? It's a bunch of hooey, it's a bunch of nonsense. He's essentially, by denying prophecy, he's denying the gods, okay? What else? How does he speak to Eurymachus? Stop, old man. Okay? He's not showing respect. One of the things that does come through throughout the whole poem is this emphasis on respect of elders. Okay? Even Odysseus shows respect to elders. So, Eurymachus gives his own prophecy. Here's my prophecy, line 210, bound to come to pass. If you, you old codger, wise as the ages, take him around and cite the boy to riot, the boy of Telemachus, he'll be the first one to suffer, let me tell you. Okay? And he keeps going on, you know, who's there to fear? 221, I ask you. Surely not Telemachus. They're saying, He's a punk. We're not afraid of Telemachus. He can't hurt us. Okay? So Telemachus responds. And he says, 237 or so, 235 or so, the gods know how things stand, and so do all the Achaeans, that is, all the Greeks. Right? And so he says, I want a good ship, I want 20 men. I'm going off to Pylos, which they know means I'm going to go seek counsel from King Nestor in Sparta, which they know means Menelaus. Right? He says, and if I catch a rumor from Zeus that my father's alive, I'm coming back. If I hear he's dead, I'll come back, do the proper rites, burial mound, the whole nine yards. Then I'll give my mother to another husband. Right? 
and then mentor takes the floor. So we had mentees, now mentor, line 250 and following, right? And he commits his household, uh, excuse me, Odysseus' friend in arms to whom the king had committed his household. That is, mentor was the one who's supposed to be watching over his household while Odysseus is gone. And mentor says, you know, don't think Odysseus is dead. He says, I don't, I don't grudge you suitors. I understand what you're doing, but you better be careful if he returns, okay? Leocritus responds, 275, even if Odysseus of Ithaca did arrive in person to find us well-bred suitors feasting in his halls, and the man were hell-bent on routing us from the palace, little joy would his wife derive from his return for all her yearning. Here on the spot, he made a humility. One man against all of us, we'd wipe him out, right? So Telemachus goes down to the beach, walks along the beach, and he prays to Athena, 294 or so. Dear God, hear me. Yesterday you came to my house, so he's, I, I recognized you. You told me to ship out on the misty sea and learn a father gone so long as ever coming home. Look how my countrymen, the suitors most of all, foil each. He's saying, they checked me. I, I can't. And Athena shows up as mentor, right? And she tells him, again, mentor, building him up, encouraging him, strengthening him. She tells him, top of page 102, around line 302 or so, 301 maybe. Telemachus, you'll lack neither courage nor sense from this day on. That kind of implies he's lacked both before. Not if your father's spirit courses through your veins. If you really are Odysseus' son, from this moment on, you'll have courage and wisdom. Okay? Now, there was a man, I'd say, in words and action. Words, wisdom, action, courage. Okay? And then she says, 309, few sons are the, few sons, excuse me, are the equals of their fathers. Most fall short, all too few surpass them. But you, brave and adept from this day on, she kind of implies, all right, forget your previous however many years. Your life kind of right now starts new. From this moment, you're Odysseus 2.0. She says, Odysseus' cunning has hardly given out you. There's every hope you will reach your goal that is, to be like Odysseus, put them out of your mind. What's the them? The suitor schemes and plots. They're madmen. Why? Not a shred of sense or decency in the crowd, nor can they glimpse the death and black doom hovering just at their heads. In other words, because Athena is a god, she can see what fate has in store. She says, these suitors are walking around with these dark clouds hanging over them, just ready to break, right? So he goes back home. He tells Antinous, Antinous what he's going to do. 347, uh, 48, now that I'm full grown, I can hear the truth from others, absorb it too. Now, yes, the anger sees inside me. I'll stop at nothing to hurl destruction at your heads, whether I go to Pylos or sit right here at home. In other words, you've taunted me enough, okay? So they go back and forth and they keep, you know, they challenge him, line 340. One of the speakers, a young buck, line three, uh, sorry, 360, line 367. Another, a young blade speaks up. They call Odysseus a drifter, right? And then we get Eurycleia, the old nurse and housekeeper introduced, right? And he tells her what to do. 
bottle up a bunch of wine, get a bunch of store, you know, supply set up. She tells him, no, don't go. You're going to leave us all alone. You're going to die, etc. And he says, 412, there's a God who made this plan. So that means two things. One, a God came up with this idea. And two, if a God came up with this idea, it's going to succeed. Okay? This isn't me just kind of, you know, brainstorming things. Um, so Athena then goes out through the town, gathers the best crewmen, etc. And we're told, 4.30, she heartened every man. That's that phrase I used earlier, where I said, in heart. Um, she, she builds up the heart of each one, okay? She goes back to the palace, and she puts the suitors to sleep. She calls Telemachus, okay? And book three, <clears throat> hold on, I got it. Clear my throat. Okay, so in book three, uh, Telemachus and his crew go off to Pylos, and Telemachus keep, uh, meets with King Nestor. Let's see here. Um, but before he does, let's see, he's speaking with Athena. And she tells him, line 19, go right up to Nestor. We'll make him yield the secrets of his heart. Just before that, line 15 or 16, she tells him, Telemachus, no more shyness. This is not the time. Uh, be bold, you know. And Telemachus replies, 25 or 26, someone my age might feel shy. What's more, interrogating an old man. Now, Kind of two things there. One, the someone my age is kind of insinuating, you know, it would be improper for me to not show deference to Nestor. Bear in mind also, you may not be familiar with this unless you've read the Iliad. Nestor is one of the heroes from the Iliad. I mean, he's, he's one of those who, who gives grand advice to the um, Greek powers and such. Okay. Um, so I mean, his his age is involved in is in definitely in that. So she tells him, line twenty nine. Some of the words you find you will find within yourself. The rest, some power will inspire you to say. Which is very similar to. Um, uh, I can't remember where in the New Testament it's in the Book of Acts. You know. Um, Peter's wondering what they will say to the Jews and such in um, and I think it is Christ tells him before the ascension you know the, the, the words will be given to you by the Holy Spirit etc so some of the words you'll find within yourself the rest of power will inspire you to say you least of all I know were born and reared um, without the God's good will, right? Notice what that means. You least of all were born without the God's good will. Well, that's a negative, make it positive. You were born with the God's good will is what she's really saying, right? So they go into town and um, Nestor's son, Pisistratus, reaches them, line 40, this is book three, and he says to, you know, um, Telemachus, say a prayer to Poseidon. His is the feast you found on your arrival. In other words, they're celebrating Poseidon, so he says, say a prayer to Poseidon. Bear in mind, totally unbeknownst to Telemachus, this could also be beneficial to his father. Here he is, the son of Odysseus, Poseidon's enemy, so to speak, offering prayers and libations to Poseidon, 
it, it might help, you know, smooth things over, let's say. Anyways, he says, according to the ancient custom, and skipping a few lines, uh, 56, he says, all men need the gods. Okay. Um, so, Pallas prays in her guise as mentor, I think. I'm going to sneeze in just a second. <clears throat> she says, hear me see, Lord, 63. You who embrace the earth, don't deny our wishes, bring our prayers to pass. First, then to Nestor, all the sons grant glory. Then to all these uh, Pylians for their splendid rights. Grant to reward the warmth of gracious hearts. Last beside, grant Telemachus and myself, safe passage home. Mission accomplished. That's bet us here in our rapid black ship. So she prayed and brought it all to pass. That is, she's praying to Poseidon to do these things, but she brings it all to pass because she's a god also, okay? So, um, Nestor's charioteer speaks to Telemachus and Telemachus answers. Bottom of that page, 109, line 85 or 86. Filled with heart, the heart Athena herself inspired. So, Telemachus addresses Nestor, tells him who he, who he is, where he's from, and why he's there. Okay? We're from Ithaca. I'm Odysseus' son. I'm trying to find out information about my father. And he says, 108, 107. More than all other men, that man was born for pain. Well, we hear in Oedipus the King, you know, which is uh, probably 300 years after this is written, that Oedipus is the man most, what, how's it put, most born for pain, okay? Oedipus will be mentioned in the poem. But we're going to hear this line several times. More than all other men, that man was born for pain. And there could be a reason for that. It could be because of Odysseus's indomitable will, his, his will to test, his will to push the envelope. Okay. So he asks, I beg you, 108, or 109. If ever my father, Lord Odysseus, pledged you his word and made a good in action, once on the fields of Troy where you and Cain suffered, remember his story now. Tell me the truth. So tell me what you can. Okay? And so he goes on and talks about, you know, the things uh, his father did at Troy and such. Um, and then lines 2, 18 and following. He talks about Agamemnon again. This is like the third rip. Agamemnon, and, and what happened, they're just going to, it's going to be referred to half a dozen times or so, at least, I think, through the first 12 books, okay? And one of the reasons in, in the beginning of the poem it's referred to so much is not because of Agamemnon, but because of Orestes. Orestes keeps getting held up as what? A model son. How so? He avenged his father's death, okay? So there we see, 224. To leave a son behind, Orestes took revenge. He killed that cunning murderous Aegisthus who killed his famous father. And you, my friend, how tall and handsome I see you now. Be brave, you too. Be like Orestes. So men to come will sing your praises down the years. Okay. Which is kind of interesting because if you think, you know, in terms of just like popular culture, even though hardly anybody knows about Orestes, I mean, he's, he's got a series of plays that are called the Oresteia. They're not called the Agamemnon plays. Agamemnon's only in the first play. Orestes dominates the second two plays. Okay. In other words, what is really remembered is Orestes and his actions. But in terms of like popular culture and such, we don't talk about Telemachus at all really. 
it's still Odysseus or the Odyssey or the other name he's known by Ulysses, okay? Um, so he goes on and talks about, you know, what great revenge that was, Ressi's fame spreads through all, all the worlds. Um, sorry, this is Telemachus speaking. He says, if, you know, 233, if only the gods would arm me in such power, I'd take revenge on the lawless, um, brazen suitors, etc., etc. But he says, but for me, the gods have spun out no such joy for my father and myself. I must bear up. That's all. <clears throat> did, did the gods spin out the joy for Orestes? That is, did, did the gods take care of the problem for him? No. Apollo told Orestes, you've got to kill your mother. Did Orestes know that because he did, that his slate would be wiped clean, so to speak? No, he didn't. When he was tried by Athena and the 11 jurors, what, what was the trump card? What was the ace that was thrown down that got him off as innocent? It was Apollo saying, Zeus told me to do this. And Athena's kind of like, well, I mean, if Zeus, then okay. All right? But Orestes didn't know that. So here, Telemachus is essentially saying, well, I can't do anything. I'm just a nobody. All right? So the old charioteer, Nestor, 242. Tell me, though, do you let yourself be so abused? Or do people round about stirred up by the prompting of some God despise you now? Are, are you just taking this? If only the bright eyed God is skipping a few lines, Pallas Athena, chose to love you just as she lavished care on brave Odysseus years ago, etc., etc. Telemachus, never your majesty. That will never come to pass, I know. That is, she won't favor me the way she did my father. What you say dumbfounds me, staggers imagination. Hope, hope as I will, that day will never dawn, not even if the gods should will it so. Even if the gods make, want to make it happen, he says, they are powerless to do so. Now that's getting pretty close to blasphemy. Okay? That's getting really close to saying, kill me now, gods. Which is why Pallas Athena breaks in. It's light work for a willing God, 263, to save a mortal even half the world away. So she's saying, if there were a God right here, right now in Pylos, that God could save a mortal even if the mortal was on the other side of the world. Myself, I'd rather sail through years of trouble and labor home and see that blessed day than hurry home to die at my own hearth like Agamemnon. She's hinting it'd be better to take the long route home and the long time home than to rush home and be murdered. Killed by Aegisthus, by his own wife. But the great leveler, death, not even the gods can defend a man not even one they love, that day when fate takes hold. If it's Odysseus's fate to die where he is, he will die where he is. Not even the gods can stop fate. That's why in that earlier, that, that um, handout screen sharing thing I did, I showed, you know, here's the gods and here's fate. Well, the gods can see fate. They know what fate has in store. They cannot influence fate and fate doesn't control the gods, okay? But the gods can relate to humans down here what fate has in store. Prophecy, okay? They can't change that. So when it's your turn to, your time to die, the gods can't change that. So they go on, they talk about, again, how Agamemnon died. And now there was no burial mound, bottom of page 115, 290 and following, okay? 
Nestor is telling us. And he goes on and talks about, you know, what Menelaus did. 330, 345 and such. Talks how, you know, Menelaus was off amassing stores of gold, you know, and Gistus killed his, killed Agamemnon. Seven years he lorded over Mycenae, rich in gold, once he killed Agamemnon. So after he killed Agamemnon, he ruled for seven years. He ground the people down, but the eighth year, Orestes came in from Athens, cut him down, etc. Okay. Why is he telling this? The story is meant as an example. It's a teaching tool, right? If your father is dead, then this is what you need to be prepared to do. Not, not to the suitors for killing Odysseus, but he's saying, you need to be prepared to take on the suitors. So you, 353, so you, dear boy, take care. Take care for what? Be ready. Be ready for all eventualities. Okay? Don't row from home too long. That is, don't stay off in, this, in your little boat for too long. Too far, leaving your own holdings unprotected. In other words, after you, after you visit Menelaus, get back home. You never know what's going on there. So Menelaus is back. I advise you to go off, visit Menelaus and such. Um, so they bunk him down for the night. They give them, you know, food and drink, and et cetera. Nice place to sleep. And Pallas Athena wings away in her eagle's form. Line 415, 416. Nestor and eyes get really big, and he says to Telemachus, line 420, Dear boy, never fear you'll be a coward or defenseless. Not if at your young age the gods will guard you so. He's telling him, Pallas Athena is on your side. I told you at the beginning, oh, if only Pallas Athena watched over you like she did your father. She is. Of all who dwell on Olympus, this was none but she, Zeus's daughter, the glorious one, his third born, who prized your gallant father among the Argives. Now, and in praise to her, O queen, be gracious, give us high renown, myself, my children, my loyal wife, wife and queen, I'll make you a sacrifice, etc., etc. All right. So we get Nestor's sons introduced, line 459 and following. And the final one, young Lord Pisistratus, he is the one who's going to go with Telemachus off to Menelaus, okay? Book four, that's where we pick up. <clears throat> so they go off to Lacedaemon. Lacedaemon, I believe is how it's pronounced. Lacedaemon, yeah, Lacedaemon. And they meet up with Menelaus and Menelaus tells them about, you know, the hospitality line, what line is that, 38 or so? Think of all the hospitality we enjoyed at the hands of other men before we made it home. God save us from such sort of tasks in the years to come. Quick, and hitch the team, bring them in. Strangers, guests to, show, to share our flowing feast. Okay, um, that's, he's speaking to his herald, essentially, Menelaus is, because the herald announced there's a couple strangers out there, and he says, you know, should we unhitch their team or should we send them off? And Menelaus is saying, come on, man, we got to show them hospitality. Sinia again, okay? They come in, Telemachus looks around, line 80 and following, he says, this must be what Olympus is like. He compares Menelaus's palace with Zeus's palace. And Menelaus hears that, and notice he keeps being referred to, the red-haired, whatever, king, warlord, prince, right? The red hair is one of those epithets. 
And we're told he cuts in quickly, 85 or so. So eh, no man alive can rival Zeus, dear boys, with his everlasting palace and possession. So don't, don't compare me to Zeus. I don't want him to get angry, right? But he says among men, yeah, I've got the most riches, right? So he talks about amassing his fortune. He talks about he just is killing his brother. He talks about Odysseus and how hard he labored. He says, I wonder if Laertes is still alive and how Penelope is doing and Telemachus. And tears stream down Telemachus's face and Menelaus recognizes him, okay? Um, he brings in Helen. Helen says, you know, it looks just like Odysseus. And then she says, top of page 129, line 158. To the life he's like, the son of great Odysseus, surely he's still with us. The boy that hero left a babe in arms, so we're, you know, probably that's in a year, when all you Achaeans fought at Troy, launching your head like battles just for my sake, shameless whore that I was. Why did she call herself a shameless whore? She went off willingly with Paris. See, there's, there's a version of the story, and you might have seen, I don't remember what it was, horrible movie a few years back, um, called The Odyssey or Odysseus or something, um, that includes when Paris of Troy visited Menelaus. And, and that's where the affair started, okay? Uh, he visited Menelaus, and Helen just gives herself up to him. But, but you gotta remember, Paris is favored by the gods. Paris, you know, you have the judgment of Paris where he decides, you know, who's the most beautiful, Hera, Athena, or Aphrodite. He says Aphrodite. She gives him a golden apple. He goes back, etc. That's what makes Hera and Athena against them so that when the Trojan War begins, you know, he's only got Aphrodite as a god on his side, whereas the Greeks have um, Athena and Hera, okay? So, um, Pisistratus says, middle of that page, 172 and such, right, you are, this is Telemachus, he wanted to see you, line 180. Telemachus yearned to see you so you could give him some advice or earn some action. When a father's gone, his son takes much abuse in the house where no one comes to his defense. So with Telemachus now, his father's gone. No man at home will shield him from the worse. In other words, he says, Telemachus is coming to you for what? He needs fatherly advice. He's got no one there. Though mentor should be providing it to give him some advice or urge on some kind of course of action. We're still in the Telemachy. The Telemachy goes through the, or Telemachy goes through end of book four, okay? So they keep talking. Helen mixes, you know, a drug into the bowl so that the boys will sleep, etc. cetera. Um, encourages, you know, singing, singing old stories to make them feel better. Um, and then she says, bottom of page 132, lines 291 and following. Right? The Trojan horse has been brought into Troy. She sees it open up. You know, the Greeks start killing Trojans, etc. cetera. Uh, Trojan women are, you know, shrieking in grief. She says, not I, line 291. My heart leapt up. My heart had changed by now. Meaning she wanted to be back with her husband. I yearned to sail back home again. I grieved too late for the madness Aphrodite sent me. Why did Aphrodite send her madness? Because her beauty was compared with Aphrodite's. She's a human. Aphrodite's the goddess of love. Luring me there, far from my dear land, forsaking my own child, my bridal bed, my husband too, a man who lacked for neither brains nor beauty. In other words, 
Menelaus was both smart and hot, okay? Um, let's see here. So they keep talking. We hear the line again, more than all other men, that man was born for pain, like 365, a book for Menelaus talks uh, about the old man of the sea, how he had to capture him in order to get back home. The old man of the sea, Proteus, the shapeshifter, and what he would need to do to get Proteus to help him. Okay. Uh, and the reason he had gone off track was because he hadn't properly sacrificed to the gods. Right? So he does what Proteus tells him to do. And let's see. He asks about Odysseus and some of the others. Okay. And Proteus slash the old man of the sea tells him about Ajax, what happened to him. And then he says, he asks about his brother, Agamemnon, because because the story that he's relating is, as Menelaus is making his way back home, he doesn't know what's happened to Agamemnon yet. And Proteus tells him about Aegisthus killing him. Um, he tells him, you better hurry home soon. Okay. And then he asks about Odysseus. Six, let's see, uh, six twenty six, six twenty seven. Um, he says, I saw him once on an island weeping, live, warm tears, and the nymph Calypso's house. She holds him there by force. He has no way to voyage home to his own native land. Um, and then he tells him about, you know, I can't tell you about your own destiny. It's not for you to die and meet your fate in the stallion. Land of Argos, know the deathless ones will sweep you off to the world's end, the Elysian fields, where gold haired Radamantis waits, where life glides on in immortal ease from mortal man. That is, Menelaus will not go to down to Hades. He will go to the Elysian fields, which is the place of the blessed after death. Very, very few go there. Oedipus goes there, okay? And, um, Oedipus at Columbus. Okay. Um, so he says, I made my way back home. I raised the mountain for Agamemnon. And <clears throat> Telemachus says, um, I need to get back home. I could sit here and listen to your stories for a year, but I need to get back home. I, I can't take your stallions, you know, because it's because not the right kind of land for them. Menelaus gives him other gifts. Um, and then we're kind of told there's a break, so to speak, about 697 or so. And now as the two confided in each other, that is Telemachus and Menelaus, banqueters arrived at the great king's palace. In other words, meanwhile, back in Ithaca, okay, and we have the suitors. And the suitors are told Telemachus has left. Okay? And we go back and forth. Antinous is angry. He says, let's get a ship and let's ambush him when Telemachus and Mentor return. Okay? Though they're told, wait. I saw a mentor leave on the ship with him. And then another guy says, but I just saw a mentor yesterday. He can't be in two places at once. Okay. Um, and so the suitors go back and forth. Let's see here. Where to pick up? 
Euryclea tells Penelope what has happened, that he's gone. Um, and Pallas shows up as Penelope's sister, tells her her son will come home, helps her fall asleep. Line 919, towards the very end of the book, Penelope says, and now my darling boy, he's off and gone on a hollow ship, just a youngster, still untrained for war or stiff debate. Him I mourn even more than I do my husband. Why? Because her husband can take care of himself. She still thinks of Telemachus as what? My darling boy. This is your kind of overprotective mother. Hordes of enemies against him scheme, scheme against him now, keen to kill him off, etc. And the phantom says, courage. Strength in your heart. It's like when Apollo tells Orestes when he's getting ready to leave Apollo's temple and run off to Athens, take heart, he says. Don't get discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed by all your direst fears. The phantom slash palace says to Penelope, he travels with such an escort, one that others would pray to stand beside them. She has power, Pallas Athena. She pitied you in her tears. She leans near to tell you all these things. And Penelope says, if you are a god and have a god's, heard a god's own voice, come. Tell me about my husband. Is he alive or is he dead? Can't tell you, the phantom answers. Okay. Book five. We open and what do we see? Council of the Gods again. Book one opened with, after the invocation, Council of the Gods. Now we have another council. This is actually the third one. Okay. We saw another one briefly in, I think it was book two. So Athena appeals to Zeus again. Only now she's not only appealing to Zeus for Odysseus, she's also appealing to Zeus for Telemachus. Line 20. And now his dear son, they plot to kill the boy on his way back home. Yes, he sailed off for news of his father, to Holy Pylos, et cetera, et cetera. And he tells her, again, you're letting nonsense slip through your teeth. Wasn't the plan your own? You conceived it yourself. That is, aren't you the one who suggested Telemachus should leave? It's it. Odysseus shall return and pay the traitors back. Notice. Short declarative statement. Telemachus, Salem home, power is yours. Okay. So Zeus turns to Hermes and tells him what? Tell Calypso to let him go. Okay. 47 or so. So his destiny ordains. He shall see his loved ones reach his high roofed house, his native land at last. Hermes slips on his winged sandals because he's a messenger, and pew, right? So he goes down to Calypso. She recognizes him as a god. She says, why are you here? He tells her, okay? She's not happy with it. She calls the gods jealous, etc., etc. She says, you know, you guys, you get to sleep with whatever mortals you want. And then says 41, 42, but so now I'll ask you guys, you train your spite on me for keeping a mortal man beside me. Skipping several lines, 150, I welcomed him warmly, cherished him, vowed to make him immortal. If he would become her husband, she would make him immortal. Okay, but Zeus says no. 161, and the guide and giant killer, guide and giant killer. killer. That whole part is a formula, okay, the epithet. Release him at once, just so, steer clear of the rage of Zeus, or down the years of fume and make your life a hell. Okay? So then we go and we see Odysseus, and he's crying. He's sitting on the beach, headland overlooking the ocean, and crying, because he wants to be home. Okay? And Calypso comes to him, tells him what he needs to do, tells him he gets to leave, tells him, I would have made you my husband, I would have made you a mortal. 
So come back home with me. Let's go to bed. We'll have sex. Tomorrow you can start, you know, downing trees, which they do. Okay. And Odysseus even tells her, page 159, line just before 240, 250, 240, 238 or so. Ah, great goddess, don't be angry with me, please. All that you say is true. How well I know. Look at my wise Penelope. She falls far short of you, your beauty, your stature, because Calypso should be drop dead gorgeous. She is mortal after all, and you, you never age or die. He says, nevertheless, I long, I pine to travel home and see the dawn of my return. Skipping up before that, 235 or so, hardly right is it for mortal woman, this is Calypso speaking, to rival the mortal goddess. How, they build, she have a better body? Calypso's asking in beauty, is she more beautiful than I am? She's asking Odysseus, what is it about Penelope? Why can't you be happy with me? And he says, you're right. She can't compare with you. And if a God, back to Odysseus, 244 or so, if a God will wreck me yet again on the wine dark sea, I can bear that too, with a spirit tempered to endure. Bring the trial on. He wants to go home, okay? So, he cuts down 20 trees. He uses an ax and adds and shapes the wood, and builds the raft according to the plan that she gives him. Poseidon sees him getting ready to leave, line 309. And he's like, what, what gives? Why is this happening? Odysseus is on the ocean, look at the sea behind me, and Poseidon makes all hell break loose. Okay, so I'm going to skip a bunch of, you know, passages where, you know, we get all the description of what he suffers at the sea. Um, let's see, where do we want to pick up? Uh, now we can skip the rest of that. Page 166. He goes under the water, he comes back up. Um, line 490. He prays. Hear me, Lord, whoever you are. I've come to you, the answer to all my prayers. Rescue me from the sea, the sea lords curse. Even immortal gods will show a man respect. Whatever wanderer seeks their help, like me, I throw myself on your mercy, on your current now. I have suffered greatly. Pity me, Lord. You suffering and cries for help. So we're kind of told repeatedly throughout the poem. Suppliants are to be respected. That is, people who are begging the gods for mercy. The gods, gods really like that, okay? What else? He identifies himself as a wanderer. Well, we're going to be told repeatedly, Zeus blesses slash favors wanderers, okay? Um, so he prays the god stems his, the current and such, and we go, he gets essentially, not quite thrust onto the island of the <clears throat> Fashions. Um, he thinks he's gonna get dashed against the reef, but he finally finds an open spot where a river has a mouth that opens to the ocean, and he makes it to there, okay? When we come to book six, and we get the description of Alcinous and his daughter, um, Nausicaa. Um, and uh, she goes down to wash her clothes and stuff. Odysseus goes up, you know, camps overnight, sleeps overnight underneath the olive trees. He hears the girls in the morning. He wonders, should I go out and 
he's naked. Should he go out and throw his arms around the the one girl's knees and you know kind of seek for mercy and kind of eh, probably not since he's naked. Um, so he cries out to her, says, "I don't know if your God is immortal, etc." And she tells him what to do. Okay, hold on a second. He pleads for compassion, line 192 or so. He says, I'm, you know, you're the first person I've seen to in a long time. He, should, he begs for a piece of cloth to put around him. Um, let's see. She tells him, you know, line 205. You're hardly a wicked man, no fool, I'd say. It's Olympian Zeus himself who hands out fortunes, who hands our fortunes out. To each of us in turn, to the good and bad, however Zeus prefers, he gave you pain, it seems. You simply have to bear it. Okay? And in one sense, you know, that's kind of the, you could say, a sub-theme, if you want, of all great tragedy. It, the, the kind of the life is pain and you have to endure it. You can't just kill yourself and end it. You have to endure it till the gods take you away. So she says, don't worry, I'll give you clothing. Um, and she tells him, uh, nobody can you know, come destroy our land. The gods love us too much. We live too far out in the, in the sea. So it, it's kind of like they don't get strangers. They don't get wanderers very often. But she does acknowledge, 227, every stranger and beggar comes from Zeus. And whatever scrap we give him, he'll be glad to get. Okay? That is, whatever scrap we give the beggar. That's, that right there, that's the basis for Xenia, for that law of hospitality. Every stranger and beggar comes from Zeus. So... When we acknowledge the beggar stranger, stranger, when we help the beggar stranger, that attention goes to Zeus. Okay. Um, so let's see. So he takes a bath essentially in the river, you know, washes all the brine from the ocean off, and Athena sits there and kind of, you know weaves a spell and makes him look bigger and taller and broader and <clears throat> more handsome than he is. He comes back out and they're like, Phew. you're like a god, you know. Um, she tells him how to go into the city, what to do when he goes into the palace. So he's going to the palace, take a left. There's my father's throne, my 340, go past him, grasp my mother's knees. Now, <clears throat> we've seen, I don't think I've mentioned it, um, we've seen some passages where grasping the knees is referred to. We're going to hear that phrase a lot. Every time in, in classical literature, when you see somebody on their knees and putting their arms around somebody else's knees, one, they, they go up so that they're facing the other person. So when they grasp, their hands go around the back of the legs, their head is on that person's knee, right? Every time that's done, that's an indication of seeking mercy. All the time. Every time you do that, that means I am entirely in your power. My life is in your hands, all right? So notice she tells him, to do that to her mother's knees. Not her father's. That kind of indicates not that her mother's, you know, the more powerful of the two, but that's where you'll get the real grace. Okay? If only the queen will take you to her heart, then there's hope that you will see your loved ones reach your own grand house. In other words, if mom doesn't Granted, dad never, never will, OK? 
Okay. So Odysseus stops and says a prayer to Athena. She hears his prayer. Okay. But we're told she would not appear to him undisguised. Very end of that book. She stood in awe of her father's brother, Lord of the Sea, who still seethed on. Okay, that's Poseidon. Why does she stand in awe? Because Poseidon's pretty powerful. It would take all the other gods to put Poseidon down. Right? So we get book seven. Um, let's see here. So she leads him in in disguise, and uh, Athena does. And around line 37 or so, she tells him, the men here never suffer strangers gladly, have no love for hosting a man from foreign lands. Well, that kind of goes against that idea of Xenia. All they really trust are their fast flying ships that cross, cross the mighty ocean. Gift of Poseidon, right? So why do they not suffer strangers gladly? Because they are protected by Poseidon. The entire island is sheltered by Poseidon. The reason they don't suffer, endure, strangers gladly is because they get hardly any of them, okay? The only guests that they receive are those that the gods allow in. So, Athena keeps leading him in, and she tells him, line 57 or so, be bold, nothing to fear. In every venture, the bold man comes off best, even the wanderer. So be bold there doesn't mean be brazen. It does mean be outspoken. It also means tell the truth, okay? So he goes up to the queen, puts his arms around her legs, and he looks around. And page lines 100 or so through, excuse me, through one, 50 and plus, okay? We get the description of the interior in the courtyard of Alcinous's palace. Golden doors, bronze threshold, silver doorposts, dogs made of gold and silver, forged by Hephaestus himself, the god of fire, okay? Young statues of young boys also made of gold, holding torches and such, okay? The garden out, the orchard, the courtyard outside has luxuriant that is just overbearing with fruit. Pomegranates, and pears, and apples, and figs, and olives, etc. cetera. And, and the, they yield these year round. It's like heaven almost, you know? Why? Because the gods favor the Phaeacians. So he runs in, he sees the king, he walks past the king, he goes to the queen, Ariti, puts his arms around her legs and begs for mercy. 179, as for myself, grant me a rapid convoy home to my own native land, how far away I've been from all my loved ones, how long I have suffered. He doesn't go in and say, I am Odysseus, please help me. He doesn't tell him his name, okay? And he sinks down in the ashes at the hearth beside the fire. Now, a wanderer shouldn't do that. A wanderer who's blessed by the gods shouldn't do that. So, Echinaeus appeals to Alson uh, Noas, and he says, this is indecent. I mean, your guest on the ground in the ashes Come on, he should be sitting in a place of honor. And Alcinous says, you're right. Suppliant's rights are sacred, okay? That's what Echinaeus says. So they raise him up and we're told, 
Top of page 186. Okay, hold on a second. So Alcinoa um, speaks, and he says, hear what I have to say. Our new friend can travel back to his own land, that is, we'll give him convoy, etc., etc. And on the way, no pain or hardship suffered, not till, like, 2.30, not till he sets foot on native ground again. That is, when he's under our care, when he's in our ship, he won't have any problems. Once he sets foot on his own land, who knows? There, top of 186, probably 231, there in the future he must suffer all that fate and the overbearing spinners spun out on his lifeline the very day his mother gave him birth. Okay? Those are the three fates I've referred to before. Clotho the spinner, who sits on a spinning wheel and spins out the thread of a man's life, or a woman's life, okay? Lachesis the measurer, who measures how long that thread will be in terms of number of years, or months, or days, or weeks, hours, etc. And Atropo the cutter. So notice, the thread is spun, measured, cut the moment of birth and it's almost like that's a fuse you, you take that first breath and the fuse starts to burn and your last breath comes when psst, the thread is no more the fuse has gone out but if he's one of the deathless powers out of the blue the gods are working now in strange new ways. Always up to now, they came to us face to face whenever we give them grand glory sacrifices. They always sat beside us here and shared our feasts. See, that, that doesn't normally happen. In, in other Greek literature, or Roman literature, you know. Um, the gods don't behave that way. They don't come down and participate in the feasts. They always stay somewhat separate. It, unless they're coming in, in disguise, like Athena often does, okay? But he says, they came down face to face. That is, I, I could say face to face with Zeus, you know. So, he says, even when some lonely traveler meets them on the roads, they never disguise themselves. We're too close kin for that. Some lonely traveler, he means one of the fashions. Close as the wild giants are, the cyclops. Well, the cyclops are what? The cyclops are Poseidon's sons. He says we're as close to the gods as the Cyclops are too. So they're descended from the gods. And you see that in Greek literature, right? I mean, we talked about that a little bit with Oedipus. Oedipus was like a great, 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 great grandson of one of the gods. I can't remember who. <clears throat> okay. As is Odysseus, as was Laer um, not Laertes, um, Atreus, Agamemnon, Menelaus, and such. So Odysseus says, nope, not a god, I'm just a mortal man. 245, whom do you know most saddled down with sorrow? They are the ones I'd equal, grief for grief. And I could tell a tale of still more hardship, all I've suffered thanks to the god's will. Okay? But he says, let me finish eating. I'll tell you a story, but let me eat first. Fine. Okay? So... He tells them about how he arrived at their island. He says, I looked up and there's your daughter. Okay. In fact, he tells them, bottom 188, 333 or so. I begged her for help and not once did her sense of tact desert her. She behaved as you'd never hope to find in one so young, not in a random meeting. Time and again, the youngsters proved so flighty, not she. 
Why is this important? Well, she's being compared, not directly, indirectly, Nausicaa, she's being compared indirectly with Telemachus. And notice, she acts exactly as a princess ought to act. Notice, she's not like the other youngsters so flighty. Well, who are other youngsters in the poem so far? The suitors, Telemachus, okay? And it's kind of implied that many of the suitors' fathers are dead. But Telemachus is also compared with Pisistratus, youngest son of Nestor. Nestor's not dead. Pisistratus acts wisely. He acts like a king's son ought to. Okay? So she acts wisely. She gave me food, plenty, shining wine, a bath in the river, gave me all this clothing. Right? So he's like, well done, Asinos. Well done. You're, you got a great daughter there. And he's like, you know, if you wanted to, you could marry her, you know. And book eight comes up. I'm skipping the rest of book seven. And book eight's all about songs, bard Demodocus singing, and athletic contests. Running, boxing, wrestling, throwing the discus, right? Athena, again, you know, lavishes a splendor on him, makes him look taller, bigger, you know, handsomer, et cetera, et cetera. Demodocus is brought in. He sings songs. He's blind, notice. Why? Some people take this as a clue to Homer because the story about Homer from the earliest sources tell us that Homer was blind and Homer might be here, you know, doing a little autobiography, so to speak. Because Demodocus is praised as the best of bards in the Odyssey. And he sings, the first song he sings, page 194, line 89 in book, what is this, book eight? The strike between Odysseus and Achilles. All right? And he sings it, and as he sings, Odysseus just weeps. I mean, tears just flowing, okay? Right? And also notice, nobody else notices that, but also knows. Okay. He says, um, let's stop the songs for a while. Let, let's go out and watch some sport. It, it's almost like he, he sees Odysseus' tears and he's thinking, I need to change the subject. Okay. So they go out and we see the young studs out there, you know, doing stuff. And one of them challenges Odysseus, a man named Laodamas, okay? Page 196, or Laodamas and Broadsea both, right? Um, Laodamas comes up to Odysseus, page 196, and says, round line 167 or so, come stranger, sir, won't you try your hand or a contest now? If you have any skill, any, it's fit and proper for you to know your sports. What greater glory? In other words, we're men. Men ought to be able to do these things. You know? What greater glory attends a man while he's alive than what he wins with his racing feet and striving hands? Come and compete then. Throw your cares to the wind. It won't be long. Your journey's not far off, and just, don't worry, we'll get you on your boat. And Odysseus says, come on, man, why are, you, why are you taunting me? Pains weigh on my spirit. No, not your sports. I've already suffered a lot. I'm just begging you guys, let me go home. Broadsea breaks in, says I knew it, mocking him to his face. 
I never took you for someone skilled in games or kind of yeoman play throughout the world. Not a chance. You're some, and he's essentially saying, you won't engage in these athletic contests because you're not strong enough, because you're not man enough, right? You're no athlete. And Beowulf's, uh, Beowulf, Odysseus says, indecent talk, my friend. I said Beowulf because this passage is eerily reminiscent of a scene in the old English epic poem, Beowulf. When Beowulf around arrives at the lands of the, uh, the Danes, and he's challenged by a character named Unferth, who says, you can't kill Grendel. If our best men can't, you're never going to be able to. Buy. And then Beowulf just fillets him. I mean, he just verbally rips him apart, like Odysseus does here, while you are a reckless fool. Now, them's fighting words. Reckless, thoughtless. I see that. So the gods don't hand out all their gifts at once, not build and brains and flowing speech at all. In other words, okay, so you might have looks, but that means you don't have any brains. So he goes on for, what, 20 lines or so, just shredding uh, broad sea, okay? And he springs up and he grabs a discus, bigger than any of the others. Discus, by the way, is where we is ultimately where we get our word for dish, right? Bigger than any of the others used, and he throws it, and he throws it farther than any of the others through the other discuses that they had, right? And so he tells Broadsea, now go match that, you young pups. He says, and I'll throw another one just as far, in fact, farther, right? He says, you wanna, you wanna, do cut? Fine. I'll take on all contenders. Actually, just one thing I want. I can't run. I've been on the sea too long. My legs have lost all their conditioning. Okay? And he finishes. That is, he does that, you know, he tells them like how far he can throw a spear, essentially. And they all stood quiet, hushed. Well, he's essentially just said, you guys are a bunch of wimps compared to me. Again, them's fighting words. That's why they all stood quiet, hushed. Now, if we were to read into this, I think that the Phaeacians are probably going, what did he say? But notice, top of page 199, 267 or so, Alcinoa says, Stranger friend, nothing you say among us seems ungracious. See, in Beowulf, the character Unferth challenges Beowulf. He says, I think you're going to die if you try to fight Grendel. Beowulf rips him apart. Beowulf calls him the worst thing, absolutely, you could call any Germanic warrior a kinslayer. Okay? In fact, he even says, he even says, you deserve to burn in hell, which the Germanic people didn't even believe in a burning hell. Okay? That's how bad it is. And at the end of all that, in Beowulf, the king, Hrothgar, Unferth's king, the one that Beowulf has offered to come and help, he kind of says, well said, Beowulf, I, I like your response. <clears throat> well, Alcinoa says, Nothing you say among us seems ungracious. You simply want to display the gifts you're born with. In other words, <coughs> he's kind of saying, you're just engaging in a little bit of hyperbole. Cool. Stung the youngster marched up to you in the games, mocking, ridiculing your prowess, as no one would who had some sense of fit and proper speech. Now, that's a slam on broad sea. That's also Noah's saying to broad sea by speaking to Odysseus. You merely replied to someone who had no sense of fit and proper speech. Okay, <clears throat> hold on a second. 
So after that, <clears throat> they finished the games, and Demodocus is brought back in for more stories. And he sings a song of <clears throat> about uh, Aries, Mars, and the Roman sy uh, system, and Aphrodite uh, getting caught in Hephaestus's bed. Remember, Aphrodite was married to the smith god or the god of fire, um, Hephaestus. Aphrodite is the most beautiful of the goddesses. Um, Mars sneaks into her bed. Hephaestus knows they're <clears throat> screwing around, literally. And so he weaves this magical kind of net, very fine chain. And he um, catches them in bed and he triggers the net thing so that it shrinks down upon them so that they're essentially held together. And he won't release them until they beg to be released. In fact, until they appeal to the other gods because he, he lets the other gods come in and have a look. Right? And so they all kind of praise Hephaestus for his ingenuity and such. Um, and Poseidon essentially uh, swears to Hephaestus that he'll make sure Ares pays. And if Ares doesn't pay, he'll pay himself. And Hephaestus is like, cool, that's fine, okay? Um, let's see here. Skipping a bit more. Pick up on page 204 between lines 440 and 450. So, Broncy, the one who earlier kind of offended Odysseus, tells Alcinous. When Alcinous says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give our guest, each of us are going to give him parting gifts. Okay. And Broadsea says, 446 or 7, great Alcinous, shining among our island people. Of course, I'll make amends to our newfound friend, as you request. I'll give the man this sword, solid bronze, hilt to silver studs, the sheath around it, ivory, freshly carved. Here's a gift, our guest, etc. One little point, by the way. Notice the emphasis on terms of the shields, um, uh, shields, daggers, swords, etc. They're all made out of what kind of metal? Bronze. This is during the what's called the Bronze Age. This is this is earlier. That is from our perspective, farther back in time than the Iron Age, right? Iron is mentioned, but it's not the most commonly used metal. Bronze is. Um, and again, that's another thing that if we, if we were to historically date the Trojan War and such, it would probably date to that period sometime between 1200 and 1500, 1200 and 1700. Um, Something like that. Hold on just one second. Let's see if I can pull up real quickly. The Bronze Age. Um, trying to find time period. In the Near East, mid fourth millennium BC, that's mid 3500 to, oh, yeah, just around 1200. So the late Bronze Age goes to about 1200. Um, the early Bronze Age goes back as far as. Um, 3,000, 3,500 BC, 
uh, trying to see if there's, yeah, in the in terms of the Anatolia, what is modern day Turkey, which Troy is on the coast of, um, probably 18th century BC to right around 1100. So 1700 to 1100. Um, So that gives you a time frame. Again, Trojan War, earliest, um, close to 12th in time, probably 1200, maybe as far back as 17, 1800, okay? So Alcinous offers this sword. Again, there's a parallel with Beowulf, which really makes me wonder if the Beowulf poet somehow knew this or these are, um, folktale motifs that are found in both words. Because in, in Beowulf, after Beowulf kills Grendel, um, and he's getting ready to go off and fight Grendel's mother, Unferth, the one who earlier offended him, and Beowulf then said he was a kinslayer and such, Unferth comes up to Beowulf and offers him his sword. And Beowulf, you know, accepts it without nary a bad word. I mean, he just, you know, accepts it and, and acts like there would be nothing wrong with that, okay? So he gives him the sword and Beowulf, you know, welcomes it, says, you know, praise, may the gods grant you good fortune, you've made amends in full, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, let's see here. Beowulf praises uh, Demodocus for his singing ability, lines 540 to 550 and following. And then he tells them his story. Let's see here. No, actually, that's still um, Demodocus. Uh, page 209, lines 6, 15, and following. Alcinous asks, um, what's his name? Odysseus to speak. Tell him a story. He wants to know who, who he is, where his family is, where he's from, et cetera, et cetera. He says, you know, and if you're not high born, if you're a slave, it's fine. Just tell us, All right? So, Odysseus does. Um, hold on. Very end of that book, book eight. My 642 or so. But come, my friend, tell us your own story now. Tell it truly. Where have your rovings forced you? What lands of men have you seen? What sturdy towns? What men themselves? Who were wild, savage, lawless? Who were friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? Tell me, why do you weep and grieve so sorely when you hear the fate of the Argives, the Greeks? Hear the fall of Troy. That is the God's work. The fall of Troy, also notice is saying, the gods made that happen spinning threads of death through the lives of mortal men and all to make a song for those to come. And he, those lines imply that all the past events of history, all the past events of human lives occur so that they can be woven into a story, a song to be told by those who follow. Really interesting. There's a lot, there's a passage in the Lord of the Rings where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are talking with Aelmer, the writers of the Rohirrim. And Aragorn and Aelmer are talking about legend and old stories come to life, et cetera, et cetera. And Aragorn essentially tells Aelmer, you know, you're a legend. It's just not told yet. The things you do or what may be legends years from now. You know, I really doubt, could be wrong, but I really doubt that, you know, uh, 
when the attendees of the Constitutional Convention or the attendees in Philadelphia in 1776 were gathering together, I really wonder if they thought, okay, people are gonna be talking about us 200 years from now. Or when Lincoln debated Douglas. Uh, interesting question. So Odysseus says, all right, and we get book nine. Then it takes them 20 lines to finally say, I am Odysseus. So they've heard stories about Odysseus from Demodocus. And Odysseus says, hello, it's me. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known to the world for every kind of craft. My fame has reached the skies. Now, the word craft there means skill. It means, I, you know, I, I can do a lot. Skill like not only craftsmanship, but we're also told he's crafty, he's cunning, he thinks things, lots of things, okay? He can get out of tight spaces with his mouth and words and rhetoric. He lies a lot, which we're gonna see when we get to book 12 and we meet um, Achilles. Knox mentioned this in his introduction. Well, Achilles doesn't like liars. And Odysseus was a, liar, was a liar. He would use lies to get out of tight spots. Okay? So he goes on and tells him, talks about being captured by Calypso and Circe and such. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip a whole bunch. We're going to move on kind of quickly. Talks about his men um, going to the land of the lotus eaters, where they eat the lotus flowers, and then they just kind of forget about everything. Okay? Um, page 214, lines 100 and following, you know, the lotus eaters they had no notion of killing my companions, not at all. They simply gave them the lotus to taste instead, and he crewmen who ate the lotus, the honey sweet fruit, lost all desire to send the message back. But he says, I brought them back. He got his man, he got him back on the boat, the lotus plant wore off, etc. Okay. Um, Talks about the Cyclops. They go to the land of the Cyclops, who so trust, top of page 215, line 120, trust so to the everlasting gods, they never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. Everything they need is provided to them by the gods and the earth. Right? And he tells us the story of he and his men with Polyphemus. Right? And how they blind him and how he tricks Polyphemus when Polyphemus, you know, asks him what his name is and he says nobody. Okay. Before they blind him, bottom of page 219, just before and after line 300. Okay. He prays to Zeus, appeals to the principle of Xenia. In fact, they say to him, since we've chanced on you, grant your needs and hopes of a warm welcome, even a guest gift, the sort that hosts give strangers. And I've, I've mentioned that before. You know, when Telemachus goes to meet Nestor and Menelaus, they both give him gifts. That's part of the Sidia mentality. That's the custom. Respect the gods, my friend. We're suppliants, we're at your mercy. Zeus of the strangers, and what does Polyphemus say? You must be a fool, stranger, or come from nowhere, telling me to fear the gods. He says, we Cyclops never blink at Zeus. Why? Because we're told the Cyclops are so powerful, so large. You know, Zeus is a little standoffish from them. Right? So he locks him in. He eats six of his men that evening. I think it's six. No, two. Two of his men that evening. Next morning, he catches two more for breakfast. Following evening, eats two more, and Odysseus gets him drunk on his wine. Okay. He tells him his name is nobody, and then they blind. Cyclops by driving the big wooden stake that's been charred and now heated and not quite on fire, but 
Embury, you know, through his eye. Polyphemus unblocks the cave, calls out to the other Cyclops for help. They ask him who's harming you. He says nobody. They laugh, and return to their own caves. And Odysseus and his men escape on the undersides of the sheep the next morning. Okay? But notice what Odysseus does. They get off in their boat. So, so think of where I am in this picture right here. That this is like where um, the Cyclops is. And, you know, Odysseus and his men, they're out here. You can't see my finger. They're out here on the edge of the water, okay, in their boat. And Odysseus, you know, yells out to them, tells them who he is, et cetera, et cetera, taunts them. He throws the rocks, okay, nearly destroys them, and then he prays to Poseidon, Cyclops, uh, Polyphemus does, to his father. He bellowed, this is on the second to last page of the chapter of the book, um, page 228, 580-something. He bellowed out to Lord Poseidon, Hear me, Poseidon, God of the sea, the domain, who rocks the earth. If I really am your son and you claim to be my father, come grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, Laertes, son, who makes his home in Ithaca, never reaches home. Sorry, there's a thunderstorm and it sounds like hail into my window. Um, so he prays and Poseidon hears his prayer. Okay. And Odysseus sacrifices the big ram, Polyphemus' favorite, okay, to Zeus. And we're told at 6, 18, or 17, but my sacrifices failed to move the god. Book 10, the bewitching queen of Eaea. Uh, so they go off to... The land, the Aeolian Isle, and they meet with Aeolus, the king, who commands the winds, and he gives them the winds in a bag. Odysseus has it stored below decks, and they row and row and row and row and row. Um, the men think it's, you know, Treasure, they unloose the bag, creates a windstorm, they go back to the island, Aeolus kicks them out, etc. So they row for several days, page 233, for six whole days, round line 87 and following. They land on an island where the last Dragonians are, right? And the last Dragonians are huge giants. They eat one of his men, the others flee. They sail on, they reach Aeon Island next. Hold on a second, so I'll bring that again, because that's shot. Eia, where Circe lives, right? You go to Eia, where Circe is, the men see the wolves and uh, the other animals acting strangely, the wolves and lions. They see Circe, they hear Circe, the men go in, Eualicus doesn't. He tells Odysseus about it, right? Um, Odysseus goes back. He's got the herb moly with him because he meets with him. Lost my spot. Her 
Hermes shows up and tells uh, Odysseus what's going to happen and how to defeat Circe. He follows his advice. And Circe says, bottom of page 240, 365 or so, you must be Odysseus. Hermes has spoken to you. He gets his men turned back from swine back into men, etc. She tells them how to leave, but she tells Odysseus, what must he do? He's got to go to the house of the dead. He's got to go to Hades, okay? Page 245. So they stay on Circe's Island for a year. And she says, in order for you to get home, you've got to go to Hades and seek out Tiresias. Same Tiresias we've seen, okay? Who can tell you what you need to do to make it home. And she tells him how to get there, okay? And he's like, how am I gonna do this? To, um, Line 550, Circe, Circe, who can pilot us on that journey? Who has ever reached the house of death in a black ship? Keep forgetting to keep, turn this on. And she tells him, she gives him the directions, and she tells him what he do, what he needs to do when he gets to Hades. Dig a trench, fill it with the blood of the bulls and such. Okay, so he does all that. He leaves his men in the ship. He goes to the kingdom of the dead, chapter book 11, okay? So, he prays for all the dead first when he lands. Um, page 250, line 36, no, line 38 or so. And once my vows and prayers had invoked the nations of the dead, I took the victims over the trench, I cut their throats, their dark blood flowed in, up out of Erebus they came. That is, all the dead. He sees, sees the shades rise and they come and they swarm, but they won't go past the trench. The, the implication is he's inside this circle. He digs the trench, fills it with the blood. They come up and such, and he sees Elpenor, his companion in the Trojan War. And he comes and he, you know, companion in the Trojan War, but who died at Circe's house because he fell off the roof and broke his neck. He says, you left me there, I'm, I'm unburied. Think, you know, Polynices from Antigone. I'm unburied, I'm not at rest, etc." So go back, when you're done here, go back, bury me, do the rites, etc." right? He says, I will. So who shows up next? Let's see. Tiresias shows up. Page 252, bottom of the page, lines 111 and following. Okay. This is after he first addressed them. Skipping it. So Tiresias drinks the blood and then he says, a sweet smooth journey home, renowned Odysseus, that is what you seek, but a god will make it hard for you. I know you will never escape the one who shakes the earth. And he goes on for Oh, line 110 through uh, 167 or so. So 57 lines or so. It says everything essentially that's going to happen to you. Okay. So he replies to Tiresias, 158 or so. Surely the gods have spun this out as fate, the gods themselves. Tell me one more thing, he says. I see the ghost of my mother. Can she speak to me? And he says, yeah, she can speak to you. She's got to come drink the blood, right? He says, anyone you refuse will turn her. If you don't let them drink the blood, then they can. So his mother comes and he speaks to her. He asks her about Penelope about Telemachus and such. And his mother tells him, page 255, she's still waiting for you. Telemachus does still hold your estate. Your father's still alive. He's off on his farm. He sleeps on the ground. He looks like a poor beggar. Right? 
She says, I, I, I died of grief. He what, tries to give her a hug, wants to give her a hug, but he's told, you know, she, he can't because she doesn't have a body. Right? He sees other people. He sees the mother of Oedipus. He sees the mother of Heracles. Interesting, the, the passage on page 258, beginning around 307, the mother of Oedipus. Beautiful epicast. In the Sophocles version, her name is Yocasta, right? J O C A S T A. S J O C A S T A. Here, epicast. Yocasta, mother and wife of Oedipus, according to the notes at the bottom of the. Um, at the back of the book under the names, okay? Um, what a monstrous thing she did in all innocence. She married her own son who killed his father, then he married her. But the God soon made it known to all mankind. So he in growing pain ruled on in beloved Thebes. Notice how Sophocles changes that. He's immediately kicked out. Lording Cadmus' people, thanks to the God's brutal plan, while she went down to death. Lashing a noose to his deep rafter, exactly what's in the play. There she hanged aloft, strangling in all her anguish, leaving her son to bear the world of horror a mother's furies bring to life. Okay. Um, he mentions a whole series of famous women. This is kind of like that catalog that I was speaking about, the epic catalog. Okay. Um, so we get all these women and they're, why they're famous, largely because of their sons or offspring. Um, Odysseus pauses and line 380, 381, Ariti, the queen of the Phaeacians says, how do you like this man now, you know? Um, also Noah says, you know, page 261, that Odysseus, you're a great bard, you've told your story with great skill, but Odysseus isn't done yet, okay? He mentions um, page 262, beginning with just before line 440, the shade of Atreus' son, Agamemnon, comes, okay? Right? And he's like, How'd you die, even though he's already heard? He wants to hear it from Agamemnon himself. So Agamemnon tells him. 464, he killed me, he with my own accursed wife. He invited me to his palace, sent me down to feast, cut me down, etc. cut down his comrades, okay? Um, Let's see here. He kind of warns him. Agamemnon does. You know, be careful when you go back home in case your wife is, is um, not trustworthy. Line 499. Uh, line 500. So even your own wife, never indulge her too far. Never reveal the whole truth, whatever you may know. Just tell her a part of it. Be sure to hide the rest. Not that you, Odysseus, will be murdered by your wife. She's much too steady. Her feelings run too deep. The curious' daughter, Penelope, that wise woman, she was a young bride. I well remember. Okay. He talks about Telemachus a bit. He says, but my wife, 513, she never even let me feast my eyes on my own son. She killed me first, his father. So I tell you this, bear it in mind. You must, when you reach your homeland, steer your ship into port in secret, never out in the open. The time for trusting women's gone forever. Which is why chapter 13, book 13, excuse me, when he goes home, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't come in like Agamemnon did in the play Agamemnon. 
he's he does not get the ticker tape parade the full hero's welcome he comes in disguised and why he interviews his wife in disguise to find out if she's really true trustworthy honorable loyal you know all those things then achilles comes in okay he sees patroclus achilles is his friend he sees achilles you know achilles is like what are you doing here he tells him i had to consult with tiresias and he's like 548 but you achilles there's not a man in the world more blessed than you never has been never will be time was when you were alive we are guys honored you as a god. His mother was a god, Thetis. And now down here I see you lorded over the dead in all your power. You're like a king down here. So grieve no more at dying, great Achilles. Listen to Achilles' reply. And the, the introduction made note of this. No winning words about death to me, shining Odysseus. And I think he's calling him shiny because Odysseus has substance. He's still alive. See, they're all shades. They're shadows of themselves. My God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man, some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive than rule down here over all the breathless dead. Talk to me about ruling in the dead. See, there's there's no joy among the dead. Notice we've got all these heroes referred to here. Menelaus is going to go off to the Elysian fields. Right? So Achilles asks about his son, um, Peleus. I mean, uh, Odysseus like, I don't, can't tell you anything about him, uh, but I can tell you about your other son, you know, Neptolemus. Sorry, hold on a second. I just messed that up. <clears throat> um, no, he asks about his father. Achilles, uh, Odysseus says, I can't tell you about him, but I can tell you about your son, okay? So he does. Um, Ajax, he wants to speak to, but Ajax won't speak to him. Okay. And then we get a listing catalog of heroes slash mythic characters. Minos, Orion, um, Titius, Tantalus, who we've talked about, Sisyphus, Hercules, Heracles, but notice it's Heracles' ghost that is there. We're told by 691, the man himself delights in the grand feasts of the deathless gods on high. It's like his spirit is there, but, but the human, the God-man, Hercules, because he's also half God, is up in heaven. Excuse me. It's all Mount Olympus, okay? Um, so, he leaves. He goes back to a ship. Then we get book 12, the cattle of the sun, okay? So, he goes back to a ship. They go find Elpenor's body. Raise a big burial mound, um, or funeral pyre. They burn him, all his armor and everything. They then raise a big, big burial mound over that, and then they stick his oar in that mound. It's a it's a symbol, okay? For here lies Elpinor, you know. Um, he talks to Circe. She tells him how he has to sail from that point on. He has to be careful with the sirens, first of all whose voices, if any man hears, they will not be able to turn away from the call of the sirens. They'll go to the sirens and they'll die on their land, okay? So he stuffs the wax in the sailor's ears. They tie him to the mast so that only he hears them. Then you have to get by Scylla and Charybdis. Charybdis, you know, the whirlpool, 
that it whirlpools three times and it spits everything back up and it whirlpools three times, okay? Scylla, the monster with six heads and 12 legs or arms, okay? Only one boat before has gotten through that strait. And, and people have suggested, you know, it's the strait of, I think it's, um, what is it? The strait of Messily, the strait of Messina. Um, Yeah, the Strait of Messina, a narrow strait between the eastern tip of Sicily and the western tip of Calabria and the south of Italy. The, the geography of Odysseus's um, travels, people have tried to trace out, and a lot of it is entirely, it, it appears, mythical. We have no idea where they are. Some places, you know, pretty clear. Um, so he gets past both Scylla and Cherubdis, okay? And they go to the island of the sun. I'm skipping a bunch. They still have food from Xerxes. He doesn't want to land, the men do. And Eurolochus, the one who on Xerxes island came back and warned him what search he was doing to his men, okay? Uh, Odysseus said, come back with me, show me how to get there, etc." He said, I'm not going back to Ireland, I know it's gonna happen, right? Okay? Eurolochus is the one who persuades Odysseus's men to go and kill the Cattle of the sun god. But that's only after Odysseus falls asleep. Okay. So they're there for several days. And Odysseus falls asleep. They kill the animals. Um, they, they promise to offer, you know, sacrifice and such. But the gods don't do it. The gods don't accept that. And Zeus sends the wind that destroys their ship. And we're told, bottom of page 284, beginning 460 and following. At last, the wind quit its wild rage. Just a second. The wind quit its wild rage, but the south came on at once to hunt me even more, making me double back my route toward cruel Cherubis. All night long, I was rushed back, and then at break of day, I reached the crag of Scylla. And he reaches up, he grabs a fig tree that's hanging there, right? He waits until what's left of his ship is spat back up by the whirlpool. He drops off, he gets on it, he held on tight, like 471. Um, in fact, they came out. And he makes his way back to Calypso's Island, or he makes his way to Calypso's Island. Home of the Dangerous Nymph, line 484, um, 487. With glossy braids, who speaks with human voice, she took me in, she led me, I cover the same ground again. In other words, and I'm back to where I was, was at the beginning of my story. Just yesterday, here at Hall, I told you all the rest. That is, from what happened once I arrived on Calypso's Island, and he was there for nine years. All these other things, just kind of boom, 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 one after another. That's why he's the man of most pain. The man most seemingly hated by the gods, right? So we will pick up next time with book 13, Ithaca at last, okay?